Hey guys, it's Evan with Evan K Exotics, and today's video is about prey selection and feeding response in your boas and your pythons throughout their life and how that develops and changes. Also, I want to talk about something that I think is a little concerning that people need to be aware about when they're raising animals up. But the first thing I'd like to do is uh, make a true request of you, or actually one request and one announcement. The request I want to make is please like, comment, and subscribe to my content. It really does help me. I don't get monetized this channel. I do it because I like the engagement. I do it because I like to talk about boas. And if you guys can do that for me, it will really help me out in terms of my algorithms. And also, some of you guys have been mentioning that like my audio and things is not perfect, and that's totally true. I've invested some uh, a little bit of money, a couple hundred bucks into some lights and things. I hope that you guys notice that there's been some improvements in the just the production quality, but um, I'm pretty close to being able to monetize this channel, not for the money, but I want to be able to produce better content. I want to put that money back into the channel and my animals for you guys. So I just say, if you can support me that way, that would be great. The other thing I want to mention to you is that I'm starting to try to get some guests onto this channel and do Zoom interviews and get some other expertise as well as some just other people that um, would be of interest to you guys. And I am going to get Lisa Benson on the Zoom chat tonight, and we're gonna film and we're gonna geek out about boas. Guys, Lisa Benton is a wonderful uh, hobby keeper. She's a home keeper who has some of the highest standards of caging in the hobby, in the industry, and she's just a really wonderful person. I'm excited to have her on. So be on the lookout for that video that I'm gonna share, and also I'm gonna put in the comment, uh, or in the description down here, I'm gonna tag Lisa Benson's YouTube channel. Go ahead and give her a like and a subscribe. She's really awesome. She's new to YouTube. She's active on Instagram and Facebook, and I think you guys will love her content. So um, beyond that, let's get into the meat of this video. And so what I'm gonna talk about is feeding response and prey selection and how they impact your keeping. And I'm gonna be talking in layman's terms. There is some science behind these things that I sort of understand. I understand some of it, but I'm gonna be talking in lay terms. But I want you to guys to know that this is supported by a field of like ethology, which is animal behavior. And so the concepts I'm gonna talk about are things that you will see, I'm gonna be talking about how those are applied into your collection. And so the first thing I wanna do is define feeding response. And feeding response is the behavior of an animal, a snake, to eat a prey item. It is not something that is always strong when an animal is born. It's something that uh, breeders are more likely to realize that feeding response needs to be elicited and developed than people who buy animals that are already started. So I'm gonna be talking about some things about that. And then I want to talk about prey selection. Prey selection, the difference between feeding response and prey selection. Feeding response is the willingness for an animal to feed when it has a food stimuli, whereas prey selection is the animal's choice of prey stimuli. So feed response is something that kind of develops over the lifetime of an animal, whereas prey selection is something that's happening in the moment every time they choose to feed or don't choose to feed. So that's something that I would tell you. Um, so that, I hope, is something to help hold on to these concepts, but feeding response um, is the response to the stimulus of food in an oversimplified way. And I'm going to keep it oversimplified for you because um, I think that's all you really need to understand to understand these points. But at the end of this video, I'm gonna give you a bonus tip and a bonus concept. So if you stay tuned, um, I will talk to you about that. But so in, in raw essence, you have a baby that's born wet from birth and inside of it, it's got a genetic code that hopefully has it instinctually coded to have a feeding response when presented with the stimulus of food. So the stimulus is food, you put that in front of the snake, and hopefully its response is it feeds. Uh, more precisely, hope, um, and I should say that all snakes have a genetic code for a feeding response. Where we get into challenges is that they don't always have a genetic code to respond to the types of food that we can offer in captivity. That's why certain like lizard obligate feeders are harder to feed on. And also, um, additionally coded within them is the uh, our other like defense and self-preservation responses that might be higher up above feeding. So when you run into challenges with feed response with new animals as a breeder, hopefully that's who you're, who's running into them, not you, the person that the breeder sold it to, you're running up against one of those two things. You're running up against them not having a encoded food response uh, to the prey that we're able to offer them, or there's some other encoded uh, behavior um, that is overriding that food response, like feeling threatened. So that's something I will tell you. But essentially you have a baby and you present it with food and hopefully it has a food response and it feeds, stimulus response. And over time, through repetition, that response is strengthened. 
okay? That's the oversimplified way to do it. So um, when you, that's what people are talking about when they talk about getting baby boas going. Like if you have a litter of baby boas, they're kind of picky at first because the stimulus um, is eliciting the response in most of them. They're not that hard to get feeding, but over time that you'll see that, that litter come into full and that response gets stronger. So over the development of the animal, that feeding response will get higher. As well as, as that animal grows, it will become less vulnerable. So other responses to stimuli like threats will become less strong. So, you know, the concept of your animal has to feel comfortable to feed. Um, that is true because what's happening is that threat stimulus is creating a response to self-preservation and to not feed that needs to be overridden. So over time, that feeding response will become stronger, both because through repetitions it is strengthened and also because those other um, factors that might be inhibiting or um, overshadowing that feeding response are becoming less strong. So that's why the feeding response is stronger. So hopefully by the time you as an individual that's purchased an animal has gotten that animal, it has been gotten out of that stage. But that's something that's very clear to see when you start baby boas and baby pythons and whatnot. So that's just something I'll tell you. And that's an oversimplified way of saying that, but it's all you really need to, uh, to know for this concept that I want to present, the concern that I'm going to warn you about. Um, but at the end, I'm going to explain something a little more complex. So that is feeding response. Prey selection is the snake's decision to feed in the moment. It's presented with a prey item and whether or not it chooses to feed. And one thing that you'll realize about um, snakes that is a little bit, uh, that a lot of people don't understand before they really work with them, is that their willingness to feed is pretty nuanced. It's not indiscriminate. It's highly conditional on certain factors being present and other factors being not present. And so, um, Prey selection is primarily a risk versus reward calculation for a snake, meaning that um, the reward of eating is that nutritional content, but there is also a risk to eating. That is both in the hunt and in the consumption of the animal, there's high risk because and we all know that, especially in the wild, which is they're always eating alive because they're taking down and hunting. Um, there are risks to live feeding, obviously, and also they have to balance the, or, and then also like, there are risks to consuming that animal. Like if you consume something too large, not only is it risky to take down, but it is also like, I just saw a video where something tried to, a snake tried to eat an, like an antelope with horns and it ripped it open. So there's that risk to it. Also the animal has to, um, has to digest longer. So it's sedentary longer. So prey size, risk reward has a lot to do with it. Um, alternatively, if something's too small, that might not be worth the risk. Uh, the number of calories they get is not worth the risk. That's why sometimes I think when you have picky babies, going up a size works better than going down a size. I think that's actually why that happens. I don't know for sure, but that's just my working theory. But um, things that affect prey se selection, risk versus rewards, the overarching thing. Prey size relative to the uh, predator, the snake, is a matter of, of uh, a matter of it uh, that matters to prey selection. The prey richness, uh, both the prevalence and also the different varieties of prey uh, matters. These are things that um, are listed as like the three main factors in ethology. I just looked them up online. So that means that if if there's tons of prey items around and that snake's gonna get many opportunities to feed, it's less likely to select a prey that's outside that ideal risk versus reward range to um, when feeding because it knows it will have another opportunity or not known like intellectually but like evolutionarily coded versus um, if something lives in a harsh environment that has a very uh, has a scarcity of food um, they're more likely to be willing to take a higher risk to eat that food so when you see these pictures of snakes that um, are taking down um, phenomenally big things uh, it says to me that one they they are they are very bold animals that feel very comfortable uh, uh, in their environment, but also that they, there's a certain amount of food desperation in them um, when they're taking down those prey. Because when we see these massive prey relative to the size of the animal, there is a, a high degree of risk in it. And the other thing that factors is where the snake uh, exists in, in the predator trophic level. So if a snake is at the top of the trophic level, it's more likely to take down something bigger because when it's digesting and it's vulnerable, it's less likely to, um, there's less risk of it getting attacked by a predator. So um, a snake that is lower on the food chain 
is less likely to take a large prey item or something that is willing to, that is likely to cause them risk of being predated themselves than a snake that's higher on the food chain. So that's just what I will tell you um, about um, the behaviors and the psychology behind prey selection and feed response. And kind of, I wanted to discuss something that concerns me and it's not so much that it's a judgment or I think anybody's doing something wrong, but I want people to understand how prey selection and feed response develop over the arc of a growing animal. And I want to say that the two things that make me, uh, that made me even think to make this video is one, um, it's pretty common to see or talk to people that are like, this snake just bit me. It hadn't bit me in two or three years and it just bit me. It just gave me a food bite. And that's actually why I brought this snake out. This is like a two and a half, three year old Argentine boa. And this is kind of about the size at which people are like, it bit me. Okay, that's um, one thing that concerns me. And the other thing that kind of concerns me a little bit is people who have, that are starting off with young snakes and below this age. So what concerns me before, before what I was just talking about is the people who are saying, well, when I handle this animal, what I do is I stick my hand in and I let it come to me and I let it feel comfortable and explore me. And then I let it, and then that's how I initiate my interactions. And I actually think that that's not a bad thing to be doing with a young animal that is um, small and inconsequential. But what I will tell you about, about all of this is that fundamentally, as your snake grows in size and grows and, and gets older, it's going to have multiple cycles of feeding response, which is going to strengthen its feeding response. It's going to become more comfortable and acclimated to your environment, which is going to strengthen its feeding response. And it's going to get relatively larger, which means that things like your hand are going to become part of the size range of their prey selection. I'm not saying that you as a human being is going to be something that they would prey select, but what that hand motion, you know, my motion of my hand in front of them, that's still more in the size appropriate range for prey selection. So all that in sum means that your animal somewhere where they develop around this size is going to become much more prone to biting you in a food way than it was before. And if you don't understand that and read the cues, you might get a bite by a adolescent snake. And that's just the, I think that's the logical conclusion to people saying, well, I have this baby snake and I stick my hand in there and I let it come to me and it explores me and it's interested in me. The logical conclusion to that is at some point, its development is going to intersect with the size of your hand and it's going to give you a food bite. And I don't even mean that in a don't do what you're doing. It's your snake, it's your hand. I, it's, I'm, don't do that with like a dangerous animal, but with an animal this size, I'm just telling you, be aware. Don't be surprised. All that inquisitiveness, all that curiosity is fundamentally food exploration. So over time, you need to understand that the psychology of the animal is going to strengthen its feed response uh, and it's going to be more willing to feed on prey that's the size of your hand. That's why people, um, that's why you see here a lot of people being surprised when they get to be about this size that it just bit me. It hasn't bit me in two or three years. And that's because it's a natural phase in the development. So then how do we manage that? And the way we manage that is by tap and hook training. That's a well-known thing. And I don't even want to recapitulate all that information because it's out there on the web for you guys. But here's what I'll tell you is that the time to start hook and tap training your snake is when you start to see a little food avidness in them. When they get a little sharky with you, when they're coming out a little too fast, when they're solidly feeding, that's when you want to start hook and tap training them. Um, that's when you want to never touch them first with your hand. That's when you want to start never sticking your hand in the cage first because that's when you're apt to get bit. The time to not start tap and hook training is when you first get your animal or an animal that's got a soft food response because it's just, you don't need to tap and hook train at that point because it's not going to food bite you and it actually might set you back. So that is um, what I will tell you about, um, about safety in your handling. And here's my bonus tip, tip for you. And remember when I said that feeding response, uh, I made it oversimplified where I said there's a food stimulus and there's a response and hopefully over time you are reinforced, you know, through positive reinforcement and repetitions, you are getting an animal that's going to feed more strongly. Here's my other piece of advice for you is it's not that 
Um, it's not that simplified, and I'm going to give you an example that's real world and useful for you if you're trying to start babies, and that is tease feeding. And the concept behind tease feeding, again, there are ideas where, uh, again, there are plenty of videos on this that will show you. I have some videos on it. But tease feeding is the concept where you mildly antagonize your snake, a baby snake that doesn't have a strong feeding response, to the point where it strikes the food. Okay? And oftentimes you'll see, you know, it'll strike, let go. You antagonize a little more, it strikes, it lets go. You antagonize a little more, it strikes, and a food wraps and it eats it. And the reason that's, that's happening is because the defensive striking is very close to a feeding response psychologically. And I don't know actually what's truly happening from a behaviorist or ethological point of view, but it is something along the stimulus response and then I'm not sure if the reason that that he's feeding is working over time is because the because there's a stimulus, you, you do something antagonized, the response is they bite, that's a defensive response. But I'm not sure if there's another stimulus, which is they now struck the prey, so now they get food stimulus closer to their scent organs, and now they have a food response. I'm not sure if it's that, or if it's because they get a stimulus, the, the antagonization, a response being the defensive bite and the consequence is they get a, a positively reinforced food set. I'm not sure which it is. It might be something different than that. I'll tell you that that's the realm of like animal behavior in a like academic setting. It's actually super interesting to me. But the point being is you can tease feed animals to get them to feed. Meaning that like with my children's pythons, um, I, I antagonize them a little bit. I have videos of this online. Boom, they strike, strike. Boom, they strike. Boom, they strike. Boom, they strike and they eat. That's how you get them started. Boa constrictors, they're hissing at you. You kind of, you get them to open their mouth, you put the prey in their mouth, they spit it out, they hiss at you again, they strike at the prey, they spit it out, they hiss at it, they strike at the prey, they eat it. So tease feeding is, um, that. those are the fundamental processes behind why tease feeding works. And that's my, uh, that's my little bonus tip to you. But I hope that all makes sense to you and I hope that's just food for thought and I want you guys to really start thinking more in that uh, behavioral way with your animals and that's kind of why I'm starting to make some points along that. Um, I'm also gonna be starting to put out some more videos like my rules for never taking a bad bite from a large constrictor and things like that. So um, that's just something I put it out there. I hope that's interesting for you and useful. Take care, thanks so much, bye-bye.